Hi, you guys. Um, sorry for the massive delay in me actually doing this, but hi. Um, yes, we're going to finish the idea today, hopefully. I give myself an hour and a half to do it, um, so it shouldn't take too long, uh, but, you know, just in case. Um, book nine isn't really that important, so it won't be in that much detail, which should be about 90 minutes for all um, all for four books. But if I have to, I'll do an extra one for book 12. You know, I can do it. Anyway, um, so um, I'm going to start from where I left off on the last uh, one. If you don't know where that was, if you're just joining me now, I would recommend that you go and look at the last stream because um, that will probably help. Um, and you'll get used to how I do it and figure out whether you like it or not. Um, okay. Just forgotten where we got to. Oh, I took the thing off. Oh, I'm stupid. Oh no. I'll go from. Okay, okay, I figured out. I figured it out where I'm going from. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna start my timer. Go down onto World of the Hero, and let's get started. Okay. So we just stopped talking about the Golden Age and how it can be compared to Augustan Golden Age because that's the sort of thing that Augustus was trying to go for in his propaganda. So now we're going to what happened after the Golden Age. So after the Golden Age, we are told that a worse age of baser metals took its place and with it came the madness of war and the lust for possessions. Alsonians and Circanian people arrived and the land of Saturn lost the name Latium many times. Then there were cruel kings and finally Evander was brought to the land by fate and a warning of his mother, the nymph Carmentis, and the authority of Apollo. So that's a lovely little Augustus link because Apollo was Augustus's main patron. So the sacred grove um, is very important in the relation to the Aeneid and Rome in uh, Evander's city. And the sacred grove is the site of a huge altar in Virgil's contemporary Roman times, the Ara Maxima, which would be significant to a Roman audience as they would recognise it from their own city. This is emphasised by comparisons that Virgil draws between the time periods. Uh, he says the house of Tarpeia and the capital, now all, all gold, but in those distant days bristling with a rough scrub. Venus then um, is terrified for Aeneas after all of this, and she goes into her husband Vulcan's bedroom, breathing divine love into her voice. This could perhaps be an example of deceptive women, as it is well known in myth that Venus despised her husband and regularly cheated on him with Mars, the god of war. And that is mentioned in the Odyssey. Uh, she tells him how she never asked him for anything except when Troy was falling, even though she wept for Aeneas and his men and the sufferings that the people of Troy went through. Uh, but now, as Aeneas is standing on Rutulian soil, she asks him to make arms for him and mentions other mothers who have come to him for the sake of help, and he has helped them. Um, so Vulcan also uh, made armour at the request of someone's mother, and that was Achilles' armour at the request of his mother Thetis, which would link Aeneas to the Homeric hero Achilles and would show that he is certainly equal to him. So then we find out how Venus achieves her end, and it's quite typical. She sleeps with Vulcan, and then in the morning he rises to go make the armour um, for Aeneas very early. Um, and the sort of simile is a bit weird. Um, it's for a woman rising in order to begin the running of her household and keep her husband's bed chaste. I, maybe that suggests that Vulcan isn't as much of a man because he allows himself to be swayed by uh, the wiles of a woman. Uh, she's deceived him and all of that. Maybe that's it. It's just a weird simile. Um, not quite as weird as some of the ones in year, uh, year nine, book nine, but you know, it's a weird one. Um, then we are told that by the, between the Aeolian Islands and Sicily, there is an island of smoking rocks, and deep within a great vault on the same place. Caves have been scooped out, scooped out to make forges for the Cyclops. Within the place, it sounds like thunder, um, and there were three Cyclops working there, Brontes, Sterope, and Pyrachmon, and they were forging one of Zeus's lightning bolts. In another part of the cave, they were working for Mars on his chariot, while others were polishing Athena's armour. Perhaps this shows how the gods are preparing for war just as the humans are. And now Vulcan tells the Cyclops to put their work aside because armour has to be made for a brave hero, Aeneas. Instantly, they all bent to the work, dividing it between them. Um, 
and they're making one great shield to be a match for all the weapons of the Latins. Various metals are described throughout this process, including gold, showing richness and heroism, and iron, which is called the bringer of death, uh, obviously because swords are made out of iron. And in Latin, um, ferrum means iron, it also means sword. Ivander then wakes up early in the morning, dresses and goes with his two dogs and Pallas to the separate quarters of Aeneas, where Aeneas was up just as early, walking with Achates. They clasp right hands and then begin to discuss the matters of state. Ivander first tells Aeneas that the help he and his people have to offer him is very different, as they are hemmed in by the Tuscan River and the Rutulians, but he has a plan to be able to help them anyway. He tells him of Mezentius and then says that he will put Aeneas at the head of the troops who are massing to take the tyrant away and have him punished. Now, Mezentius is described very negatively as a ruler. We are told that he holds a despotic rule as king and that he is ruthless and has committed foul murders and other barbaric crimes, being called a tyrant. We are further told that he developed a new form of torture where living men are roped to dead bodies, tying them hand to hand and face to face to die a lingering death, oozing with putrefying flesh in this cruel embrace. After long enough, his subjects rose up against him and besieged him in his palace, but he escaped and took refuge under the protection of Turnus, and now the whole of Etruria has risen up and come to arms to de demand that he be given up for punishment. Uh, this sort of um, tyrannical king could link to the Romans' kings. The Romans really didn't like their kings. Now, the message of the old prophet um, is that the Etruscan warriors have a just grievance that drives them to war and that their anger against Mezentius is just and their wish for him to be punished as well. But that heaven does not will it that the Etruscans should ever obey in Italian. Um, he says, you must choose your, war your leaders from across the seas. Now, Vanda speaks of how the Etruscan army had been held back by fear of these warnings and how Tarkon has sent envoys to him with crown and scepter, offering him the royal insignia should he come and take over the kingdom and the camp because Evanda is not Italian. However, Evanda says that he is too old for command and that age has taken the speed from my feet and the warmth from my blood. He then says he would urge Pallas to go, but that Pallas is part Italian through his mother's side. Therefore, he believes that it is Aeneas who is favoured by the fates and that he is the man the gods are asking for. Then Evander sends his son Pallas, our hope and our comfort, and wishes that he could be hardened to war under his leadership and admire Aeneas from his earliest years. He finishes up by telling him that he will give him 200 horsemen, the flower of our fighting men, and Pallas will give him 200 more in his own name. Then there is a sudden flash of lightning and a rumble of thunder sent by Venus, and the whole sky seemed to be crashing down upon them with a blast of an Etruscan trumpet. They looked up as great peals broke over their heads, and they saw glowing red armour. Everyone else was astonished, but Aeneas saw this and knew that it was his mother fulfilling what she had promised. He tells Evanda that this is Venus telling him that war is threatening, and that she is going to bring armour made by Vulcan down to him. Then he laments the beginning of the war. He says, alas, what slaughter wakes upon, waits upon the unhappy Laurentines, what a punishment Turnus will endure at my hands. After this interpretation of the omen, both Evander and Aeneas made a sacrifice of duly chosen yearling sheep, and then Aeneas went back to Evander's house to choose men of outstanding courage to follow him to war. Others went to tell Ascanius about his father, while the Trojans going to Etruria were given horses, and Aeneas's horse wore one great tawny lion skin with gleaming gold gold claws. That is obviously a Hercules link, which then comes to be an Augustan link. We are told that um, Evander clung to the hand of Pallas inconsolably when he was leaving, and he said that if age had not taken his strength away, he would still be fighting for himself, and no power on earth would be tearing him away from his arms, oh my beloved son. And he would have stopped Mezentius before all of this came to pass. He then beseeches Jupiter to take pity on him and asks that if Pallas is going to survive, he be given life and a harder heart to endure suffering, but that if fortune has horror in store, he would rather die now before he knows what the future brings, and while I still hold you in my arms, oh my dear son, my only source of joy. Once he has spoken these words, he collapses, and this is perhaps an omen or a confirmation of the fact that Pallas will die. Pallas then appears in the middle of the column of soldiers, conspicuous because he's wearing a Greek military cloak and brightly coloured armour. He is described in a simile that likens him to the morning star. Um, so he was like the morning star, which Venus loves above all starry fires as he leaves his ocean bath and lifts up his holy face into the sky to scatter the darkness. Now, 
I got this off Wikipedia, uh, but Wikipedia is normally accurate for classic stuff, so we're going to trust it. Um, so the Wikipedia said, the morning star is an appearance of the planet Venus. Um, Venus is the brightest object in the sky um, after the sun and the moon, outshining the planets Jupiter and Saturn. But while these rise high in the sky, Venus never does. This may lie behind myths about deities associated with the morning star, pride, proudly striving for the highest place among the gods and being cast down. So perhaps this could suggest that Pallas outshines all of the other people within the army because he is so conspicuous, but emphasises the fact that he will die during this war. He won't live to rise as high as Aeneas or as high as he would perhaps um, if he wasn't involved. Now, I need, uh, Venus sees her son away from all the others, alone in a secluded valley across the icy river, and so she came to him without a disguise. She uh, gives him the promised gifts, the armour, including a terrible crested fire-spurting helmet, a death-dealing sword, a huge unyielding breastplate of blood-red bronze like a dark cloud fired by the rays of the sun and glowing far across the sky, and the polished greaves of richly refined electrum and gold, and tells him not to hesitate when he goes into battle because of this new armour. Here she hugs him, and this is significant, as previously we have had three lost embraces with Creusa, Anchises and Venus, and so perhaps this shows that now fate is finally being fulfilled, Aeneas is now going in the right direction, and he is now able to see his mother. And now... Um, we have a look at the shield. We have a bit of an ekphrasis here. Um, there are various events shown from mythological and historical um, example, and we are told that Vulcan had laid out on it the story of Italy and the triumphs of the Romans and all the generations that would spring from Ascanius and all the wars they would fight. Now, we have first a mother wolf, Luper, in the cave of Mars with twin boys, Romulus and Remus, around her udders. We have the rape of the Sabines by the Romans at the Great Games and a new war between the Romans and Sabines led by the Sabine king Tatius. We have two four horse chariots tearing Metis in two while Tullus dragged him through a wood. And this is interesting because Metis was a dictator of Alba Longa who betrayed the Romans in battle after making an alliance with them and withdrawing his support from them, planning to wait it out and join the winning side. For this betrayal, he was torn in two by chariots running in opposite directions by the Roman king Tullus Hostilius, who destroyed Alba Longa. Then we have Porcenus ordering the Romans to take Tarquin back after they had expelled him, mounting a siege against the city while the descendants of Aeneas were running upon the drawn swords of the enemy in the name of liberty. He was raging and blustering because Horatius Cocles was tearing the bridge down and Cloelia had broken her chains. Now Cloelia was a hostage taken from Rome as part of a treaty and she fled leading away a group of Roman virgins. Porcena demanded that she be returned and she was and Porcena was so impressed by her bravery that he allowed her to choose half of the remaining hostages to be freed. She chose all of the youngest Roman boys and after this the Romans gave her a statue at the top of the Via Sacra showing her mounted on a horse as an eques. Manlius then is standing in front of the temple keeping guard on the Capitol Hill. There was a silver goose honking to announce the approach of the Gauls and then the Gauls were shown entering the city. Vulcan put next to them the Salii, the priests of Mars and the na naked Lubakai and chased matrons leading procession through the city. So during the Gallic siege of Rome in 390 BC, Marcus Manlius held out for months with a small garrison in the citadel while the rest of Rome was abandoned. When the Gauls were attempting to scale the Capitoline, Manlius was roused by the sacred geese and rushed to the spot and threw down the closest assailants. He then shows Tartarus in the punishment of the damned, with Catiline hanging from his beetling crag and shivering at the faces of the Furies. He also shows the righteous next to them, with Cato administering justice. Catiline attempted to overthrow the Republic in the Catiline Conspiracy in 63 BC, and there was some speculation of whether or not Caesar was involved in this. Perhaps this is a veiled criticism of Caesar. And Cato was a Republican martyr who committed suicide when he saw that Julius Caesar had taken over and become dictator after defeating Pompey in battle and uh, defeating the Republican forces in the Battle of Thapsus in February 46 BC. This could be another criticism of Caesar. Both of these figures are also from Republican times and both inclusions seem to speak for the glory of the Republic. Is this Virgil suggesting the Republic is far better than what the people have under Augustus? Or is this playing on the propaganda that Augustus was restoring Republican values? Perhaps it is both. Between all of the different scenes ran an 
broad expanse of swelling sea with a circle of dolphins pit out in silver. Uh, this is believed to be Oceanus, a divine figure who was the divine personification of the sea, an enormous river encircling the world. Perhaps it's a suggestion that what happens in Rome is all that matters and maybe the rest of the world is not important. But you do have to consider the limited world worldview. While they knew of some places, uh, they didn't know the whole earth, so they wouldn't really be able to um, pitch that, in a sense. Um, and yes, um, also the dolphins would be significant because it shows Venus's favour. Then we have the middle of the shield, which is perhaps the most important part of it, and it describes the Battle of Actium. This was the battle that Augustus fought in forty uh, in thirty one BC against Marcus uh, Marcus Antonius, otherwise known as Mark Antony, and Cleopatra. And it was the basically the last battle that sort of happened before he got sole ruled. He was essentially in sole rule, but not particularly until about twenty seven BC. So there are bronze armoured fleets at the battle and the battle was drawn up with the whole of the headland of Lucas seething and all the waves gleaming in gold. Augustus is leading the men of Italy into battle alongside the Senate and the people of Rome, its gods of home and its great gods. Aeneas leading shows him as a brilliant leader and general, which is certainly not true. We have knowledge from other sources, such as Mark Antony, although that could be biased, that he ran away from the battle against Hirschus and Panzer um, the battle with Hershey's and Panzer, sorry, against the assassins Brutus and Cassius in 42 BC. And Agrippa actually fought most of his wars for him. Also, the mention of the Senate and the people and the gods shows the idea that Augustus was uniting the people and restoring the Republic with the full support of the gods. There was also a double flame streaming from his forehead, like Ascanius and Lavinia, which is a sign of ruling and importance in the future of Rome, and it's also a sign that Aeneas shares in Book 10. And Julius Caesar's comet shone above his head, which is a sign of his deification. Agrippa was leading his forces with favouring winds and favouring gods and wearing the naval crown. Virgil is careful to qualify that these ships are Agrippa's ships rather than Augustus's. Perhaps this is suggesting that the only reason Augustus has any power is because of Agrippa. Then we have Antony. Antony is shown as having the wealth of the barbarian world and warriors in all different kinds of armour, and this is a clear distancing of him from Romans, and it emphasises how he is supposedly being corrupted by the East in his marriage to Cleopatra. Cleopatra is not named, but described as Antony's Egyptian wife and the greatest outrage of all. This follows the blame poetry of the time, such as Horace's, which did not name Cleopatra in order to heap more shame upon her. A good example of that is um, Toast Actium Epode 9 by Horace, or um, A Woman's Power by Propertius. The battle is described gloriously, which shows the importance of the battle and the dramatic nature of it. Um, the Egyptian gods are described very negatively and the aspect of the animalistic parts of them is a clear way of making fun. The Romans thought they were ridiculous and grotesque. Anubis barked and all manner of monstrous gods levelled their weapons, apparently. The Roman gods are shown as glorious and perfect. There in the eye of the battle raged Mars engraved in iron and this shows that Augustus had divine favour in the Battle of Actium. Apollo in particular is emphasised as the reason that Cleopatra begins to flee and Apollo is linked to Augustus, so perhaps this shows that Cleopatra fled um, at the might of Augustus. Various monsters from Tartarus and Hades are mentioned, including the Furies and Discord, which shows the horror of war, and Cleopatra is shown as fleeing, which emphasises the otherness of her and the way that she is a coward. Uh, we're told that she's pale with the pallor of approaching death and the Nile with grief in every line of his body, opening his robes and with every fold of drapery beckoning his defeated people into his blue, blue grey breast and the secret waters of his river. This is a very sympathetic presentation of the Egyptians and so could be backhanded criticism of Augustus and Rome. Then, um, Augustus is shown remarkably positively, um, finally on the shield, riding into Roman triple triumph, and he is linked with Aeneas through mention of piety and that he was paying and dying vows to the gods of Italy. He is shown as very popular as he is greeted with joy and festivities and applause, and he was seated at the threshold of the Temple of Apollo, inspecting the gifts people had brought him and watching the defeated nations walk in long procession in all their different costumes and in all their different armour, speaking all the tongues of the earth. There is then a long list of the different enemies that Augustus has defeated, and this shows the power of Rome. Now, 
first, um, well last, uh, we need to explore the significance of the shield in relation to a lot of different themes. So first we have Aeneas, the hero and the warrior. It links Aeneas to Achilles, another great hero who received a shield from a Vulcan at the request of his mother. He is linked to a Homeric hero here and Purcell, not the composer, uh, says that Aeneas's explorations are less detached than Odysseus's because he has no homeland to return to, and this is the long-awaited destination, the future home of his descendants. It also emphasises how brilliant he is, as he can use armour that has been touched and made by a god, and he's also interesting to the gods and has godly favour, which further shows his heroism. It also links Aeneas to Augustus, which could be transferred heroism. Um, linking Aeneas to various mythical heroes before, such as Romulus and Remus, emphasizes his importance to Rome and his position as a founder, as well as Augustus's. And elsewhere in the book, Aeneas is linked to Saturn, the bringer of the Golden Age. And this also, again, links him to Augustus, because Augustus was seen as the bringer of a new Golden Age. Mackey says that the role of Saturn in the book is as a forebear of Aeneas. Like the Trojan hero, he is exiled from his lost kingdom, following which he brought together in the likely ray in the Rudy race, gave them laws and began a golden age of peace. And Mackie tells us we also see a close connection between Saturn, Hercules, Aeneas and Evander, all outsiders who come into Latium, live a life of frugalitas and impose peace and order by their efforts. Then we have the Roman aspect. Anderson says that this is the most Roman book of all, probably because it talks so much about Augustus and Rome. The emphasis placed on Aeneas and Augustus on the shield links them together and thus makes it as if Aeneas and Augustus are equally important to the furtherance of Rome and the Empire. Purcell again says that the future which is being evoked and a feature of Roman Virgil's time, not so much at all. Um, there's a battle of Actium um, glorifies that battle, which is a key part of Augustan propaganda. He apparently uh, restored peace through this, although I don't agree with that. Um, he is also described with the gods as well. The gods are on either side. This isn't just a little fight. It is the concern of the gods. So it shows the gods will always be victorious over foreign gods and Egyptian gods are not made fun of. Half animal aspect is not understood as the Roman gods were anthropomorphic. Mark Antony and Cleopatra are named but firmly um, allied firmly with Egypt. So Antony is shown as not truly a Roman, more Egyptian than Roman, and they are both foreign others. We also have myth mythological and historical Rome. Romulus and Remus being mentioned links Augustus and Aeneas to them, showing them as founders of Rome in a sense. The rape of the Sabine um, allowed the Roman men to populate their new city. The punishment of Metis betrayed Rome, perhaps a warning to those who betray Rome like Mark Antony. Uh, Chloelia is a powerful woman like Augusta, um, Livia. Catiline and Cato links back to the Republic, and this is the pretense that Augustus was restoring the Republic rather than wrecking it. Anderson suggests that the whole episode is designed to illustrate the unswerving bravery of the Romans of old. Then Epic, um, this is an extended kind of ekphrasis, and it emphasises Virgil's learning and the Epic convention here, uh, links the Iliad with Achilles' shield, and Allegory, the stories of the shield almost seem to describe nowadays, such as Meta symbolising a warning to those who betray Rome and its mission, and Mark Antony. And finally, Homer and Virgil, there's a link to the Aeneid with Achilles' shield, further patterning of Homer's work now that we are in the Iliad stage of them. And that is book Eight. And now we have book nine. Yes, we do. Sorry. Okay, so book nine. Um, it's sort of split into sections this time. So section one, we have Turnus's attack. Juno sends Iris down to tell Turnus that Aeneas has left the city. And so now is a prime moment to attack. Turnus follows her orders, saying, I follow this great sign, whoever you are that call me to arms. Turnus's troops, as they mass, are described like the fertile waters of Nile when it withdraws from the plains and settles back at last into its own channel, perhaps thinking Cleopatra and how she fled from Actium. They are doomed to fail. They are also described in rather supernatural terms, called a distant cloud of black dust. While this could just emphasise how far off they are, it's almost as if they're a force of nature, and this continues throughout the book. Turnus goes ahead of the rest of his army, saying, um... Virgil tells us that Turnus had taken wing and gone on ahead of the slow-moving column, which perhaps shows him as an individualised Homeric hero. This is further emphasised by the furor and karma he shows when he is stalking around the Trojan camp. 
with a lovely wolf simile that's also very interesting. The wolf is a kind of Roman simile because of Romulus and Remus, and perhaps this shows how Turnus is somewhat Roman because of this. We see this further on in the book with the fact that the Tiber saves him and takes him back to his men. The simile could also show how relatively useless the Trojans are without Aeneas. So here's the simile. Turnus in a fury prowled round the walls this way and that, searching for an approach where there was none, like a wolf in the dead of night, lying in wait in all the wind and rain by a pen full of sheep and growling at the gaps in the fence while the lambs keep up their bleating safe beneath their mothers. Beside himself with anger, he storms and rages but cannot reach them. He is worn out by the ravening hunger he has been so long in gathering and many a day has passed since blood wet his throat. Uh, he also uses fire as a weapon and is described with fiery terms. So he has a great blazing pine torch and he's burning with fury. Uh, this, because fire means passion, especially in book four with Dido, could show similarities between them while also showing how uncontrollable passion is. Although, of course, it's not love for Aeneas. It's very much the opposite. Aeneas' ships are protected from being burned by Sibylle, the earth goddess, and Jupiter, the king of the gods. This perhaps shows how Aeneas has the utmost support from the most Roman gods and goddesses. Sibylle is an originary titan, after all. Uh, Gaia, if you like the Greek stuff. Turnus's men are amazed by this, but he fires them up by a brilliant speech, which shows that he's a good leader. Think about how in Book 10, Virgil tells us that the two sides have equal strengths and leaders. Aeneas's forces are also shown to work rather well, and he could be linked to Odysseus because his men cast lots for the dangerous posts, just like Odysseus's men did in Book 9. Uh, he's been quite a good leader here, which is quite surprising, to be honest. Um, but he's always better than Odysseus, because Odysseus is absolutely dreadful, but you know. Um, section 2, we have Nysus and Euryalus. We are shown Nysus and Euryalus again, who are one in love. Um, so they're together, Erastos and Eremenos, and they seem to be polar opposites. And Nysus is a f formidable warrior, and Euryalus is no lovelier youth among the people of Aeneas. Through this section, we are given a clear example of power and passion and wish for glory. He's um, pierced to the heart with the great love of glory. Does every man's desire become his god, laden with booty and much slaughter done and glorious deeds? They go to speak to Ascanius, who tells them that they should go and do what they are asking to do. They want to storm the Rutulian camp and take a message to Aeneas. Ascanius's characterization here is interesting in the absence of his father. Uh, we have family piety, my whole life hangs upon the return of my father. Um, the image of his love for his own father touched his heart. But there's also a lack of Roman mercy. He wants to give them 12 chosen matrons and 12 prisoners of war, which is against Roman policy. So perhaps it shows that Aeneas has to be there to sort of lead his um, future Romans. And he's quite a good leader. He takes control in his father's absence. Nysus removes the head of a man called Remus, just like Romulus really removed his brother's head. So perhaps that's sort of a link to that. Um, the Rutulians are shown as kind of morally bankrupt. They have been gambling and drinking, which would go against Roman moderation and stoicism. Nysus is then described like a Homeric hero, much like Turnus with virtually the same simile. Uh, we are told that Nysus was like a lion driven mad with hunger and ravening through pens full of sheep, dumb with fear, while he growls from jaws dripping with blood as he mauls and champs their soft flesh. He's the victorious lion, Turnus is the one who cannot get to the lambs, and Euryalus joins him in his hunting imagery. Um, we're told he's already prowling on hot for blood, but Nysa stops him, noticing that he's being carried away by bloodlust and greed. Does this perhaps show that the old have a didactic purpose of teaching the young of moderation? Euryalus takes Ramnes, is, uh, he's a Rutulian, um, he takes his meta medallions and belt and puts them on his shoulders and then puts on the helmet of Mesippus. But the gl glittering betrays them to a group of cavalry who have been sent with dispatches to Turnus led by Vulcans. Nysus gets away but cannot find Euryalus, so goes back and finds him caught by the troops. So he begins to throw spears to distract them in an attempt to save Euryalus. Vulcan says that he will kill Euryalus if the person throwing the spears doesn't come forward. So Nysus comes forward saying that his only offence is to have warned, loved the wrong friend too much. And then Vulcan kills Euryalus anyway. Euryalus is given rather feminine imagery in his death. We are told he's like a scarlet flower languishing and dying when its stem has been cut by the plough. Or like poppies bowing their heads when the rain burdens them and their necks grow weary. 
Nysus then kills Vulcans as he himself is killed and falls on top of Euryalus' body in death. And Virgil interrupts to tell us that they will never be forgotten while the house of Aeneas remains by the immovable rock of the capital and the father of the Romans still keeps his empire. The Romans thought that the Roman Empire would go on forever, so that basically means they'll be remembered forever. The Rutulians stick Euryalus and Nysus' heads on spikes, and Aeneas's men see them. Then, rumour carries news of Euryalus' death to his mother, who is crazed with grief and filled heaven with her cries of mourning. Here we see a female victim of war, wailing as women do and tearing her hair, and she asks Jupiter to let her be the first to die and to blast her detested body into Tartarus with his lightning. Grief is also described as a flame, which shows uncontrollable emotions. Section 3, we have the battle. The Volsci are locked in tortoise formation. This is a Roman battle move, and so this would emphasise the future of the Romans. Virgil plays the Calliope, the um, epic muse, to enrol with him now the mighty scroll of war. And this could be seen as positive about war, as he describes it as mighty, but it's more of an epic invention, I think. Um, there is a lot of violence. Turnus throws a torch that sets fire to the Trojan's tower, and a lot of people die. Helenor is described as like a... Um, wild beast trapped in a dense ring of hunters it rages against the steel and hurls itself to death by springing onto the hunting spears um and he rushed to his death where he where he saw the steel was thickest uh turnus is again described the roman ideas in this section he's said to be like the eagle the armor bearer of jupiter or the wolf of mars tearing a lamb out of the sheep pen uh, he's the victorious wolf yet again perhaps this is suggesting that this is the truth of the romans uh, and this section ends with an even more graphic descriptions of death which is lovely um, section 4 is Ascanius and Apollo. We find out that it is during this battle that Ascanius first shoots in war, which becomes a kind of rite of passage for him. And Numenus, he's Tyrannus' brother-in-law, and we are told that his heart was swollen with pride and he was swaggering and shouting abuse, and this shows the importance of moderation. He tells Ascanius and the Trojans that they're fighting like women, um, but Ascanius turns on him, praying first to Jupiter, and then he shot him through the head with his arrow. Um, and it mingled with the sound of thunder, which shows divine approval. Apollo then appears to Ascanius, which is important because he's Augustus' favourite god, and tells him that he has become a man and will live to be the father of gods. He made for him, taking the form of Butes, Ascanius' armour-bearer, and tells him to ask for no, for no more, my boy, in this war. The Trojans recognise Apollo, which shows that they are heroic, because only her heroes can recognise gods. So perhaps that's problematic, but I think it's probably just showing that both sides are equal. The battle is described with nature similes, showing just how fierce and uncontrollable it is. It was like a great shower from the west drumming on the earth in the rainy season when the kids are rising, or like hailstones dropping from the clouds into the sea when the south wind is blowing and Jupiter hurls down squalls of rain in his fury and bursts the hollow from the clouds in the sky. Pandarus and Bitius are described as twin towers and a pair of tall oaks by a flowing river, which shows their strength and emphasises their heroism. Then we have section five, which is Turnus' attack part two. We are told that Turnus is raging and storming in creative havoc and that he is a savage, he's in a savage rage. And other heroes are described similarly, such as Bitias. Uh, we are also told that Mars is getting involved in the battle, which shows just how important it is and how fierce the war is. He puts new spirit and strength into the Latins. Uh, Turnus bursts into the Trojan camp and Pandora's accidentally locks him in like a great tiger among helpless cattle and then Turnus calls himself an Achilles and starts killing lots and lots of people with plenty of gory detail. We are told that had Turnus thought and let his men in, i.e. had he not been an individualistic Roman hero, then he would have beaten the Trojans then and there but his mad lust for blood drove him upon his enemies in an ecstasy of passion. Finally, Turnus is eventually surrounded when Menestus and Serestus, the Roman leaders, come in and fire up their men. And we are given another line simile for Turnus, emphasising his heroic qualities and his power. So we're told that it's um, the Trojans are crowding him like a pack of huntsmen with levelled spears, pressing hard on a savage lion, etc. Uh, Juno cannot help him because Juno... Jupiter prevents her, and so he jumps into the Tiber, and the river takes him back to the Sun Raids in high spirits. There are some general notes here. Uh, Nisus. 
Um, he's a Homeric hero. He's given a simile of a lion more than once, which emphasises his position as such. And maybe this is why he has to die. We're moving away from Homeric heroism now. He's fiercely protective by, of Euryalus. He's like a father figure and a lover, which shows the duty of an older man to teach and protect a younger one, which is like Erastes and Eremenos from Greek culture. Look that up. Um, he gets revenge for what has been done to him, which shows the importance of revenge in this culture. Uh, for example, Augustus's revenge for Julius Caesar's death. Euryalus is very young. He is the quintessential youth who, through his death, shows the devastating effects of war. His mother's reaction to his death further shows this. She shows the human effect of war, especially on women and mothers. Um, her greed he is technically killed because of his greed because he insists on taking a helmet and wearing it which is the thing that has them seen and he's an object of massive sympathy ascanius is a proto-leader he takes over from his father and does all that he can to keep the trojan camp safe in ascanius ab absence a sally knight suggests that he has a tendency towards self-glorification He's not merciful like a Roman should be. He offers Nisus and Euryalus 12 matrons and the same number of prisoners of war. Without his father to guide him, perhaps, as Sally Knight says, Ascanius lacks the humanity that the new hero should display. Uh, he's heroic. Apollo appears to him and only heroes can see gods. Uh, he's got family piety. His whole life hangs upon his father and he weeps remembering his love for his father, etc. And he's growing up finally. And then we have Turnus. He's a Homeric hero. He violently kills many people. He's described with Homeric style similes and he's an individualistic hero. Sally Knight says he's a person of standing, a hero who presents a worthy challenge to Aeneas. Uh, we see the power of passion and the Roman problem. He is described in similes that befit a Roman, such as the eagle or the wolf, which cause some kind of problem. Perhaps Virgil is pointing out that this would have been the original Roman hero and that Augustus has changed this to fit his own ideology. He's even brought back by the River Tiber, which is quintessentially Roman. The Trojans. The Trojans are shown as relatively useless because they lack their proper leader behind Turnus. Uh, the gods, Juno wants to help Turnus, but is prevented from doing so by Jupiter. Mars incites the war to carry on because he loves uh, chaos. Jupiter sets fate in motion and ensures that the ships are turned into nymphs. Apollo, he appears to Ascanius, but emphasises his heroism and links directly to Augustus. Sibylle, she is on Aeneas' side. She's the ultimate earth goddess, the mother of the gods on his side, which perhaps shows fertility, but probably just shows how important he is. Uh, war, it's Sort of positive will enroll the mighty scroll of war, and there's some Aristea, which is um, heroic killing sprees, but it's quite negative because there's lots and lots of gory and gruesome death. Uh, William suggests in Homer there is indeed pathos and sorrow for the dead, but war is accepted as necessary and indeed almost a natural part of the heroic world. In Virgil's time, especially to a peace loving person like Virgil, it seemed inevitable but perhaps much less acceptable. He betrays them in a way that emphasizes the tragedy rather than the triumph. Then there's piety. Ascanius prays to Jupiter before he fires his arrow, showing his piety towards the gods, and he listens to him when he tells him to stop fighting. He's also pious towards his father as he says how his whole life hangs upon Aeneas's return. Heroism, we have Homeric heroes, Nisus, Turnus, Euryalus, and Ascanius, and in some ways there is a lack of Roman heroism because Aeneas is not there. He is the proto-Roman, and so in his absence his men revert to what they know. And finally, literary, historical and social context, we have Propertius's The Temple of Palatine Apollo, has Apollo speak directly to Augustus as he does to Ascanius here, and perhaps this shows their ancestry in Apollo's favour of the Julio-Claudian line and such. Uh, Marcellus' death, perhaps the grief of Euryalus' mother here, echoes Octavia's grief. She is said to have fainted when Virgil mentioned Marcellus in Book 6 during a private reading. Uh, the idea that the Golden Age wouldn't continue if Augustus was taken away like Saturn was. The troops seem to somewhat fall apart when Aeneas isn't with them. And we are told that Ascanius will be father to gods, which is a link to Julius Caesar, Augustus' eventual deification, and the further deification of other emperors of Rome, along with the court worship of them. And now we move on to book 10. I'm just going to get some water, which is on the other side of my room. So bear with me. So I don't lose my voice, you know, that'd be kind of embarrassing in the middle of the live stream. I just lose my voice. Hashtag not spawn. Hashtag really not spawn. 
hashtag not spot on. Hashtag not accidentally flushing you either. Okay, so book 10. Um, this is one of my favourite books, probably because I'm doing it in Latin as well, but it's a good one. It's good for pessimism about Augustus. Okay, so Jupiter has called a council of the gods in his palace among the stars from where he looks down on the battlefield and the Trojans. He asks them why they have gone back on their word and why they are fighting with such bitterness of heart when he is forbidden Italy to fight with the Trojans. Essentially, he is telling them that he's not okay with the concept of war between the Trojans and the Latins and that it needs to stop. Jupiter um, says that the time will come for war and mentions the Punic Wars, saying that barbarous Carthage will let destruction loose upon the citadels of Rome and hate will vie with hate. This is surprising because obviously we have recently left off from Juno, who previously said that some descendant of hers, Hannibal, um, would destroy the Romans or at least seek to. By mentioning the Punic Wars, Virgil is bringing up what were the most devastating wars in Roman history, and so this would create tension and pathos, and also emphasise that this war was fated, and so it wasn't the Romans' fault. Venus makes a number of arguments after her initial flattery of Jupiter by calling him the imperishable power over men and over all the world. She says that the Ring of Fortifications no longer offers protection to Aeneas and the Trojans because the Rutulians are rampant and Turnus is swollen with the success of his arms. She says that Aeneas is far away and knows nothing of this, and so he was unable to bring peace to the Trojans and Rutulians in his absence. She tries to appeal to his fatherly devotion because she references the fact that she was wounded by a spear in the wrist from Diomedes in the Trojan War, and says that it will happen again because she will stand in the way of the fighting. She says that if the Trojans have come to Italy without his approval, um, he has the right to punish them and not to help them, but then emphasises that Jupiter did allow them to come to Italy, and so he should allow them to fight to stay there. It is fated. She gives what is probably a false promise and asks that she be allowed to save Ascanius, saying that Aeneas can be tossed by storms in unknown waters and go the road that fortune gives him. She says that Tyre, Carthage, will have nothing to fear from Ascanius. Is this perhaps a reference to the Punic Wars? Maybe without Aeneas around and his descendants, the Romans would not win the Punic Wars. She says that it would obviously be better if the Trojans had simply been allowed to settle the ruins of Troy rather than travelling all of this way for nothing or to die on the battlefield. All of these arguments are cleverly surrounded by a building up of pathos. Venus is just a meek goddess and she needs her father's help to protect her son and grandson. Um... Then Juno asks why Venus is forcing her to break her silence over the matter by reopening the wounds she has already suffered by letting Aeneas go forward and do what he wants, and then says that neither man nor god compelled Aeneas to choose the ways of war and confront King Latinus as an enemy. She says that he was goaded into coming by the ravings of Cassandra, and that she was not involved in anything that caused the wars, the blatant lies she got Electra involved, and that Turnus has every right to defend his land from invaders. She then tells Venus that she does plenty to help Aeneas by turning ships into nymphs and taking him away from the Greeks in the Trojan War, and so her and the other gods have every right to give the Rutulians their help. She tells her finally to keep Aeneas away and says that she is hurling empty abuse at her because she didn't plan for anything to happen, like a war. Do you, um, Virgil then describes the deliberating of the gods as like the murmuring of a storm when the first breeze is caught in a wood and the rustling rolls um, the rustling rolls through the trees unseen, warning sailors that winds are on the way. It is effective because it is a natural simile, and so one that most readers would be able to understand. Furthermore, it is effective because it is like a Homeric simile. Homer loves a good sailing sim simile, or at least one about the wind, um, as well as it gives the idea of brewing war and brewing involvement of the gods. Jupiter says that since the gods will not let the people be joined together with the treaty, he will let each man face his fortune, and he will treat the Ro Trojans and the Rutulians alike. Uh, Jupiter is the same king to all men. He swears an oath by the Styx, which is unbreakable, to emphasise that he will not favour either side when it comes to the war, and then rises from his throne and is escorted to the threshold by the other gods. The gods at this point are shown to be conflicted as a body, because none of them seem to be in agreement as to who should win the battle, and so they are leaving it to fate. The fact that they leave what is going to happen to fate shows that the gods cannot defy fate and emphasises its power, while we are almost set up with a clear, clear spread of opinion in the gods over who should win the war. Venus is on the Trojan side, Juno with the Rutulians, and Jupiter is right in the middle, impartially judging all of them. Perhaps the fact that there is discord on Olympus echoes the discord on the Earth itself. 
Ascanius is in the middle of lots of other warriors, and he is described with the epithet boy, which emphasises his youth and therefore heightens the pathos which we feel for him. The simile of a gem is used to describe him, which perhaps shows his importance and his royal nature, as he will come to found Rome. He was like a gem sparkling in its gold setting, an adornment for a head or a neck, or like glowing ivory skillfully inlaid in bockwood or Orissian ter terebinth. His skin is pale white and his hair golden, held in place by a golden circlet. Aeneas is sailing on the ocean after leaving King Evander when the fighting is taking place around the Trojan camp. He has been to the Etruscan camp to tell him of what he offers and the violent passions of Turnus and appealed for help, at which Tarkon, the leader, instantly joined forces with him and made a treaty. The Etruscans committed themselves to a foreign leader in accordance with the will of the gods. Aeneas sits on his ship, turning over in his mind the chances of war, and the young Pallas stays close to his left side. The epithet young makes a link to Ascanius, and perhaps shows the father-son relationship type that we can see developing between Aeneas and Pallas. He cares for him like his father does his son, and will avenge him in the same manner. Then we have a lot of um, different allies. I'm just going to put them by name tells Aeneas that they have come to him as nymphs after they were burnt by Turnus when they were his ships. This happened in Book 9. They have turned into nymphs because Sibylle asked Jupiter to bless them when they were created. She then tells Aeneas that his son Ascanius is trapped among the Latins bristling for war and that Turnus has a sound strategy to defeat his troops. He will set his troops between Aeneas and the Etruscans and his Trojan camp in order to prevent them from joining up. In order to prevent this, Aeneas must take up the shield that Virgil, uh, Vulcan made for him, not Virgil, and uh, order his allies to arms. Tomorrow's daylight, if you consider my words are not useless, will witness huge heaps of Rutulian slaughter. Now, the nymphs are Aeneas' sheep, sheep, ships, built, burnt by Turners, but who were blessed by Jupiter at the request of Sibylle. Um, Aeneas lifts his heart at the omen and he prays to Sibylle that she will be his leader in this battle. I think my laptop's overheating. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Um, his heart lifts at the omen and he prays to Sibylle that she will be his leader in this battle and stand by the side of her Phrygians and give them her divine blessing. As he spoke, the day dawned and Aeneas follows the order of the nymphs, telling his men to fit their minds for the use of their weapons and prepare themselves for battle. He orders his allies to follow the standards and prepare for battle, which shows that he is a good leader. Sorry, just taking my memory stick out. My laptop's making noises. I'm a bit scared. Um, he, he doesn't just throw them into the bloodshed with no proper explanation and is open and honest with his troops and like Odysseus. Um, he stands on top of the stern of his ship and raises his shield high and the Trojans raise a shout, fresh hope renewing their anger as they hurl their spears like Strymonian cranes giving out their signals under the black clouds trumpeting across the sky and uh, flying before the storm winds with exultant cries. Uh, this shows how much power and courage he inspires in his men. Virgil then says that on the top of Aeneas' head there blazed a tongue of fire, baleful flames poured from the top of his crest, and the golden boss of his shield belched great streams of fire. This fire imagery could link to the omen in Book 2 of Ascanius being destined to found the Roman race and to become a great leader, when a flame licks his head. The fact that this fire is also compared to a comet is also significant because of the contextual Julius Caesar's comet in 42 BC that marked his deification according to Octavian and the Senate. Because Julius Caesar traced his lineage back to Aeneas, this would be especially significant in highlighting this. Turnus's bold confidence doesn't waver, however, and he quickly takes up position to prevent the landing. He tells his men that brave men have the god of war in their own right arms, and that fortune favours the bold, which shows his confidence in brute force and bravery. He doesn't really seem to think things through like Aeneas. As well as this, he also mentions the men's homes, wives, and their father's deeds, which perhaps emphasises his position as a Homeric hero. He is looking for glory, while also building some sympathy. The enemy have families too. Um, Aeneas helps his men come down from the high sterns through the use of gangways, showing that he is at first hand and that he is getting involved. Furthermore, he really throws himself into the battle and doesn't stand back, perhaps a critique of Augustus, who was known to take a back seat in battles. Uh, Aeneas was the first to move against the army of the country people of Latium and lay them low. Then we have a list of all the people he kills. Theron, described as the tallest of their warriors. Lychas, whose mother had been dead when he was born and he was dedicated to Apollo from birth, but it did him little good now. Um, a huge Gaius and tough Cisseus, Pharus, Chidon, Clytius, the sons of Phorcus, seven of them, whom he faced by himself, but with little help from Mummy. Um, Clausus of Curious and lots and lots more. 
After this long list of people that Aeneas kills, he is further shown to be an active warrior leader through the fact that Virgil states, just so clashed the armies of Troy and the armies of Latium, foot planted against foot, and man face to face with man. The Arcadian troops are then fleeing from the Latins that are pursuing them. They are on foot because they're not used to infantry battles and because the rough nature of the ground due to the rivers had caused them to dismiss the horses. Pallas sees them and asks them where they're fleeing to and then implores them by their pride, bravery and the name of Evander, the wars won and the hopes rising in himself to gain a glory like his father's. He tells them not to trust their feet and instead to cut through the enemy and go to where the fight is th thickest. That is where your proud fatherland requires you and your leader Pallas to go. He emphasises the fact that they are fighting against a mortal enemy who have just as many lives and weapons as they have and then asks whether they should flee or seek Troy. Pallas then throws himself into the thick of his enemies and kills a large number of people, listed as follows. Lagus, he stabs him between the ribs from behind with his spear. His bow, he buries his sword in his swollen lungs as he tried to surprise him from above. He kills Thenius and Anchemelus, the twins Lorides and Thymba, who are a source of confusion and delight to their parents, but now Pallas made a grim difference between them. He cut off Thymba's head and Lorides' hand. Um... Roetius speared as he went past in his chariot, laid, laid on fairies, Demodocus, Strymonius, and Halysus. Um, he prays to the river Tiber that his spear will kill him, and it quite obviously works. The Arcadians were stung by the hero's reproaches and amazed by his deeds, and so they were roused to continue fighting. As well as this, Pallas is described as a shepherd in a simile describing how he watches his men begin to fight. Uh, it's a shepherd firing a wood at different points. Um, this comparison to a shepherd perhaps links Pallas to Aeneas, who is also described as a shepherd and therefore perhaps shows his potential, although this will rather quickly be cut down. This is particularly significant as it shows Aeneas, uh, Pallas as more than a little boy who doesn't know what to do, but the fact that he goes so far with it could suggest that there is perhaps danger in Fiora and so um, soon Pallas will die because of this unrelenting anger. Lausus then we meet and he is the son of Amazentius and he is mentioned in a similar killing spree to palaces. We are told that both armies are equal in their leaders and in their strength and this is echoed by the emphasis placed on the similarities between Lausus and Pallas. They are the same age and similar in stature and handsomeness and um, but fortune has denied each of them a homecoming. We are also told that they were both to die at the hands of another foe, perhaps foreshadowing both of their deaths. Virgil places great emphasis on the fact that both armies are equal in strength and leaders, and so this shows how it is an equally fought battle, and both sides have just as much heroism and the possibility of winning as the other. Turnus then takes Lausus's place at the suggestion of his sister Juturna, an immortal, and he tells his men to stand down and says that he is the only one who should attack Pallas. He says, Pallas is mine and mine alone. Then he says that he wishes his father were there to witness his death, which perhaps emphasises his savagery and gives a sense of foreboding. Pallas watches Turnus where he is standing as the Rutulians leave the field at his command, and he stood amazed at the sight of Turnus, running his eyes all over that mighty body. The way that Turnus is described perhaps suggests again that he is a Homeric kind of hero, because there is a lot of emphasis placed upon his physical prowess. He then tells him, the insolent prince, um, that he will win renown on that day for either a glorious death or for stripping Turnus's corpse, and that his father will bear both fates equally. Then he strode to the middle of the battlefield and the blood of the Arcadians froze in their breasts. Virgil then makes a simile of the lion and the bull to describe Pallas and Turnus. He says, like a lion which is seen from some high vantage point, a bull practising for combat far away on the plain. This perhaps shows how Turnus is practising battle, but Pallas is not, and he is clearly at a disadvantage. However, it is also a Homeric style simile, so it shows that as well. Pallas then attacks first, praying to Hercules that his spear would reach its mark in Turnus. Uh, Hercules hears him and weeps. But Jupiter, his father, speaks to him and tells him that every man has his allotted day, saying that all life is brief and time once passed can never be restored, but the task of the bread die. Pallas hurls his spear and it just grazes his skin between, between the shield and the armour, but not bad enough to stop Turnus from continuing to fight. Then Turnus raises his own spear and throws it, saying, now see whether mine is any better at piercing, and it beat through the middle of Pallas's armour and bore through that mighty breast. Pallas desperately tears the spear out and blood and life came out together after it, both by the same channel. Then as he died, his bleeding mouth bit the soil of his enemies. 
Turner stands over his dead body and tells the Arcadians to tell Evander he is sending him back the palace he deserved. He tells him he will allow him any burial, but that his hospitality to Aeneas will cost him dear. Pathos is created for Pallas in this in many ways, primarily the following. Hercules weeps when Pallas prays to him, which shows that he will never win and that Hercules cannot fulfil his prayers. Jupiter turns his eyes away from the battlefield, perhaps showing that he doesn't want to witness Pallas die. Turnus's words and the way he speaks about Evander and Pallas bring pathos because he's made unlikable. Pallas's desperation in trying to get the spear out of his chest gives pathos as he is naive and it is in vain. He is just a little boy. And the mentions of Evander and how he is sending Pallas back to him dead create pathos as it is the break of the qu- it is the breakup of the quintessentially Roman father-son relationship, and we have witnessed the despair of Evander and the closeness of their relationship. Through this, there is a clear presentation of the fact that Pallas is too young for this war, and that Turnus is despicable in how he speaks to him and kills him. Turnus then plants his foot on Pallas's body and tears off the baldric which he is wearing, which is against Roman protocol. You're meant to take the armour off of the defeated enemy respectfully and then dedicate it to the gods, but Turnus takes it for himself. On the baldric, an abominable crime is shown, and this is the murder of a band of young men on the night of their marriage, and their chambers were, chambers were covered in blood. This is significant, perhaps, because it shows how Pallas's murder is also an abominable crime, but also because it is technically Turnus's wedding night, and so this perhaps foreshadows the fact that Turnus will die too. Turnus stands over his dead body and tells the Arcadians to tell Evander he's sending him back the palace he deserves. We've already spoken about this. I don't know why I've written it again. Um, there is an emphasis on the fact that no man knows what fate has in store for him. And then Virgil says that the time will come when Turnus will pay and pay richly to see Pallas alive and un- unharmed. We are told that he will bitterly regret killing him. And then we are told that Pallas's comrades carried him back to the camp on their shields, weeping. Aeneas hears through rumour and then through a reliable messenger that Pallas has died and that his troops are in danger. Then he seems to see red and he harvests everything in front of him with the sword, and he was burning with rage. We are told that before his eyes he could see Pallas Evander, everything, the table he had sat down to that day when he first came to their house, and the right hands of friendship they had given him. He also commits human sacrifice too. This is absolutely horrifying, and perhaps this shows the power of furor and also the violence that Aeneas can commit. If we consider it from a pessimist debate point of view, it could be a critique of the Octavian character of Augustus. Then Aeneas kills a lot of men. He kills four sons of Silmo, four sons of Uthens, Magus, who is a priest, who begs for mercy, but he kills him anyway, uh, which is especially awful. Hymenides, who's another priest who he kills, Kyclus and Umbro, Anxa, Tarquitus, Antaeus and Lucas, and Numa and Camus. Um, while he's killing people, Aeneas is described as like a Gion, who they say had a hundred arms and a hundred hands, with fire flaming from fifty breasts and mouths, and fifty was the number of swords he drew against the lightning of Jupiter, fifty the number of identical shields he clashed. This emphasizes his anger. He also kills Nepheus and Lucagus and Liga, even as they beg for mercy. Um I'll go into particular detail on Magus and Lucagus and Liga. Um, so with Magus, he aims the spear at Magus's head, but Magus runs beneath it and clasps Aeneas's knees, begging him to spare his life for the sake of his son and his father. He tells him that the Trojan victory does not depend on him and that his one life will not make a difference, but Aeneas tells him that he can keep his war, tra- war trading and that he will die. So judges the shade of my father Anchises, and so judges Ulysses. He then bends his head back and drives his sword into it when he was still begging for mercy. Now, Lucagus and Liger were travelling across the field together in a chariot and raring for battle, but Aeneas could not endure to see such fury and further, so he rushed forward to meet them. Liger tells him that he's no longer in Troy and that here in this land there will be an end to his wars and to his life, and Aeneas prepares a reply that was a javelin rather than words. The javelin comes through the bottom of his shield and pierces his left groin, and he falls from his chariot and lies dying on the ground as Aeneas says to him that death was his own doing. Liger then jumps off of the chariot and begs him to spare him and take pity on him as a suppliant, but Aeneas cuts short his appeal and says, Die now, a brother's place is with his brother. As he spoke, he stabs Liger in the chest, opening the hiding place of the soul, and then we are told how much death Aeneas causes on the battlefield, like a raging torrent of water or a storm of black wind. Now Jupiter and Juno discuss the battle. Jupiter comes to Juno and tells her that she was right and that it was not just the Trojans' own strength but also the help of Venus that was maintaining their advantage. 
Juno then tries to blackmail him and says that she should be allowed to withdraw Turnus from the battle and keep him safe for his father Dornus. She then says that he should die nevertheless, but adds that he is descended from the gods through Pelumnus and his generous hand has often weighed, weighed down your threshold with abundant gifts. Jupiter then replies that if she is asking for a delay of his death, he will let her rescue Turnus. He makes it clear though, that his death cannot be prevented forever and that she cannot thwart fate. Juno weeps and says that she wishes that he would recast his plans so he can do so and choose a better cause. Um, Jupiter comes to Juno and tells her that she was right. Ooh, hang on. Oh, she was right that Venus is helping. Sorry, I've just written that again. Uh, I've also written that again. And I've written that again. Okay, Juno decides to go down and help him, snatching him away from the battle. She drives the great storm before her towards the battle line of the Trojans and then fashions out of vapour an effigy in the form of Aeneas, a weird sight, a shade without strength or substance armed with Trojan weapons. Virgil tells us that it was like a spirit from the underworld and the first line of warriors saw it and goaded Turnus into fighting it. Turnus throws his spear and the apparition turns and runs and so Turnus goes in pursuit, shouting taunts at him and not seeing that all his exultation was scattering to the winds. Juno, um, while Turnus is jumping across the gangways of the ships in his pursuit of the Phantom Aeneas, and as he jumps onto a ship, Jupiter tears it away from its moorings and takes it out to sea. The Phantom disappears, melted into a black cloud, and Turnus is shocked, turning back to look at the shore and raising his hands in prayer to ask why he's being taken away, calling it a disgrace and a punishment. Turnus sees the fact that he's been taken away as a disgrace and punishment and says that he's left them all to die and prays that he would die so that no Rutulian and no word of his shame can follow him. As he spoke, he was thinking of ways to kill himself, including running himself through with his sword or jumping off of the ship to try and drown or swim back to his men. Three times he tried each way and three times mighty Juno held him back, pitying the young man in her heart and would not let him move. He is taken to the ancient city of his father, Dornus. Mesentius is then described, um, he takes the place of Turnus in the battle and he is described as having furiously fallen on the triumphant Trojans. The Etruscan troops fall on him immediately, united in their hatred and press him hard, but he is likened to a rock jutting out in the ocean wastes, exposed to the threats and fury of wind and wave and bearing all the violence of sea and sky unmoved. We are given a list of people that he killed violently. He killed Lategus, Palmas, Euanthes and Minus. He gives his armour to Lausus, his son, to put on his shoulders. Virgil likens Mezentius to a wild boar, um, so a great beast and um, something that people fear to go towards. Um, and where's the other one? Oh, there's only one. Oh, I must have written that one. There's only, wrong, there's only one simile for some reason I wrote. Oh no, like a rock. He's like a rock. A rock just hanging out in the ocean waste. Sorry. So a boar and a rock. Um, these two similes are effective. So the rock suggests Mazentius' sheer immovability, like nature. Mazentius cannot be moved by all the men's forces and show it shows his heroism, although not in a modern concept. The simile of the boar perhaps shows how Mazentius is uncivilized in the Roman sense, hence the adjective wild. Uh, wild. Um, it also perhaps excuses the fact that none of the Trojan warriors go forward to fight him. He's like a volatile wild animal, but also he's a bull, and Pallas has been described as a bull. Pallas died, so Mazentius is going to die. Mm -hmm. hmm. Mazentius with Orion, a giant huntsman turned by Zeus into the constellation we know of today, when he strides across the plain to meet Aeneas, and this emphasises his power. Um, the effect of these further similes um, shows violence and power, and um, it also sort of enhances Aeneas's heroic status because he can beat a man like this. So when um, Mazentius meets Aeneas, Aeneas picks him out of the ranks of men and goes to meet him. And um, he measures a spear cast and says that his vow is to strip Aeneas of his army and clothe his son with it and his trophy over Aeneas will be his own son. He throws his spear, but it bounces off of Aeneas' shield and strikes Antores, a comrade of Hercules who attached himself to Evander. Aeneas then hurls his spear, and it flies through Mazentius' shield, through the triple bronze, the layers of linen, the three-stitched bull hides, and then sticks in Mazentius' groin, but without much force. Then, exultant at the sight of the Etruscan's blood, Aeneas draws his sword to finish him off, and then Laucus helps his father. He sees him wounded and moans bitterly, weeping. 
The Virgil interjects, giving us a kind of spoiler as to what's going to happen, saying that he shall tell of his cruel death and glorious deeds, um, and says he does not deserve to be forgotten. Mezentius falls back, defenseless and encumbered, when Lapsus throws himself between them just as Aeneas was standing to his full height and raising his arm to strike. Laus and his comrades shout and bombard Aeneas from afar until the father could withdraw, protected by the shield of the sun. Aeneas is enraged and keeps under cover, and then Virgil gives us a storm simile to describe how he copes with the battle and the violence. Um, just as when the clouds descend in a sudden storm of hail and all the ploughmen and all the workers in the field scatter across the open ground. Um, just so Aeneas, overwhelmed by missiles from all sides, all sides, weathered the storm of war until the last roll of its thunder. He threatens Lausus, asking him why, is, why he is in such a haste to die and saying that his love for his father is deceiving him. And Lausus, however, is in full cry and his madness knew no check. So Aeneas' anger increases and the fates gather up the last threads for Lausus. Aeneas drives his sword through the middle of his body to the hilt, the point going straight through his shield. Uh, no proper armour to match the threats he had uttered. It also pierces rather poignantly the tunic his mother had woven for him with a soft shred of gold and filled the folds of it with blood. His soul leaves from his boat, from his um, wound and goes in sorrow to join the shades in the underworld. When Aeneas sees Laos dying, he's described as the son of Anchites and we are told that he groans from his heart because he thinks of his own devoted love for his father. He speaks to the dead body that he's just pierced, leaving his armour with him and saying that he does not know what gift can be worthy of a heart like his. He then says to him, rather strangely, that his one consolation for his cruel death is that he fell by the great hand of the great Aeneas, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, he lifts Lausus off the ground to prevent him from soiling his carefully tended hair with blood and turns on his comrades, ra railing at them as they hung back. Mazentius keeps asking about I Lausus as he is soothing his own wounds because he hasn't seen him die and he's called an anxious father. Lausus's comrades are carrying his body back on their shields, weeping, and he's called a mighty warrior laid low by a mighty wound. When, when Mazentius hears the railing and realises what must have happened, he soils his hair with dust, raises both hands to the skies and throws himself on top of the body, asking, was I so besotted with the pleasure of living that I allowed my own son to take my place under my enemy's sword? He asks whether Lausus has died so that he might live and then says that for the first time death is bitter to him. He speaks about how everyone around him despises him because of his evil deeds, but that he wishes that he had paid it with this guilty life by every death a man can die. Then he raises himself from his son's body and his spirit is unsubdued as he orders his horse to be brought. When he sees his horse, Rabus, his glory and his comfort, he says that they have both lived for a long time and that either they will be victorious and carry back the head of Aeneas with the bloodstained spoils stripped from his body or they shall fall together. Mazentius then charges into battle, frenzy and grief all seething together in his heart and shouts Aeneas's name three times. Aeneas knows his voice and offers up a prayer, asking Jupiter and Apollo to fight with him. And then Mesentius says to him that he has taken his son and calls him a savage, saying that that was the only way you could have found to destroy me. After he has spoken to Aeneas, Mesentius begins to hurl spears at him, planting them in Aeneas' shield as he flew round him. But the shield holds fast. He rides three times around him and three times Aeneas pivots with him, turning his shield with its bristling forest to bronze spears. Aeneas is eventually weary of the fight and bursts forward, throwing his spear and catching Ribus between his temples. Ribus throws Mezentius, dislocates his shoulder and then falls on top of Mezentius with his head, pinning him to the ground. Aeneas goes towards him and tears his sword from its sheath, taunting him, and then, after Mezentius has spoken, Aeneas stabs him in the throat and he pours out his life's breath in wave upon wave of blood all over his armour. Mazentius asks why Aeneas jeers and threatens him with death, saying that he did not come into battle on these terms and that Laus has struck no bargain on his behalf. The one favour he asks for is that he can be buried in the earth. He says, protect me, I beg you, from their fury and let me lie in the grave with my son. So now we have some general like theme questions. I don't think we're going to get to book 12 today considering we have 20 minutes left, but you know, we can, we can get a close spot possible so to what extent does the Virgil glorify war if at all in book 10 he sort of glor glorifies it with the Aristea killing sprees um but 
Turnus is more of a Homeric hero, while Aeneas seems more reluctant to go to war. Perhaps this shows that because of the enemy of the Trojans is a Homeric hero, there is a conscious movement away from Homeric ideals and therefore the glorification of war. A just war in an Augustan style, Aeneas has the divine okay from Jupiter and some divine support. Camaraderie, we see the leaders inspiring their men, fired by the hero's rebuke and gazing at his outstanding deeds, which shows the camaraderie. We see palaces with Aeneas and it brings the Trojans and the Crusaders together in war. We also have a distinction between pious fury and impious fury. While the human sacrifice and brutal death that Aeneas inflicts ignore any form of mercy, they are arguably due to pious fury because he is angry about the death of Pallas, and we could link this to the Achilles' fury after the death of Patroclus. Turnus's fury, however, is arguably impious because he has no reason to be so furious and Aeneas. It was fated that Lavinia would not marry him and that she would marry a foreigner instead. But we could argue that Turnus is a foreigner because he comes from Mycenae and Aeneas is from Latium because he's descended from Dardanus who came from Latin. So is it really impious and thus is Aeneas's pious? Then we have negative aspects. So deaths of young men which break up fathers and relationships. We have Pallas, Lerides and Thymba, Patroclus, Lausus, all of them. Uh, Pathos, Pallas's death and Lerides and Thymba's deaths. Uh, priest Magus begs for Aeneas to spare him. Death of Lausus. A barbarity of war, human sacrifice. Um, long lists of deaths due to Aeneas and Pallas. Uh, pitiless Mars, Aeneas is called a savage. Too many emotions. Um, Turnus's arrogance in killing Pallas when he glor glories in his death and takes his belt. That's bad arrogance and is literally the epithet for their hated king Tarquinius Superbus. The actual Latin used is Superbus. Um, Aeneas's fury and the murders of Lausus and countless other men, which shows uncontrollable furor and which is too Homeric perhaps. Um, it's all for women, like the Trojan War. Lavinia is like Helen, fought over by two men who lead massive armies between whom supported the gods are divided. And Jupiter does not want war. He allows it, but he doesn't support either side and remains impartial. So we could suggest there is no godly support. Um, and war described very negatively. It's described as the plague of war. So in my opinion, it's described extremely negatively. Aeneas then appears at the end of this book as more Homeric, and certainly towards the end, because he takes revenge for the death of a close friend, he shows a lot of bloodlust and karma with a real enthusiasm for battle, and he does a lot of killing, which would be typical of Aristia and Iliadic style killing sprees. However, to a modern audience, audience, and probably even partially to an ancient audience, his behaviour is absolutely abhorrent. A modern audience would not like the human sacrifice, the murder of a son and father, bloodlust, savage, and extremely unlikable. If we take Aeneas as a figure of Augustus, how the hell can we even begin to suggest that this book is optimistic about Augustus and his principle? Ancient. Um, ancient audiences would see human sacrifice as bad. Um, we've got the example of the one in the Iliad where Agamemnon sacrifices his own daughter, Iphigenia, and the gods do not like that. Um, murder of a son and father, and the importance of fathers and sons in epic and in society. You've got patronymics and everything. It's a very important relationship. Uh, he's called a savage, far from a civilised Roman man. From a Roman context, they didn't condone the Iliadic warriors like Achilles because they gave into their emotions like Fura, but this is entirely against stoic ideals. Um, and he's again, he's extremely unlikable. In my eyes, Aeneas is not really a hero at all at the end of this book. Um, book 10 relates to epic poetry as well. We have several features of epic poetry shown in this book. Violent, this like and gory descriptions of battles to so Aristea, Wall of Three used many times, epithets, similes. Um, then at themes, so piety towards your family, Lausus saves his father and dies for him and Mesendius avenges him, Aeneas is snapped out of his fury when he remembers his father, Juturna seeks to help her brother and her brother listens to her, Aeneas is incited to go and fight because of the danger to his son by the nymphs, Pallas seeks to keep up the glory of his father by fighting for him, and Venus does not obey the orders of her father Jupiter and continues to help the Trojan in the battle, which shows family and piety towards her father, but the family piety towards her son. Religious, so Aeneas prays to Apollo and Jupiter before he kills Mesentius. Pallas prays to Hercules before he attempts to kill Turnus. And human sacrifice, although this is a somewhat dodgy one, as it is sacrifice to the shade of Pallas, and the gods do not particularly like human sacrifice. State the Arcadians are roused to fight by the name of the leader and the memory of their country. And technically, by fighting in the wars he does, Aeneas is showing his piety towards the Roman state. 
family relationships as well. So father-son relationships, we can see um, the advice giving capacity of the father with uh, Hercules and if I say Zeus, Jupiter. Um, we can see the filial duty. So sons are meant to be a glory to their fathers, like Pallas, like Lausus, like Ascanius. Um, all of them. Uh, it's very pathos because we see so many of them broken up. Evander and Pallas, technically Evander and um, technically Aeneas and Pallas because he becomes sort of a father figure and Mazentius and Lausus as well. Just a lot of things that are emotions and duty and everything. Um, mother and son, you've got Lausus and his mother. She made a tunic for him that is pierced through by Aeneas's spear, so that shows a lot of pathos. And Venus continues to help her son, even though she's been told not to. We've got brother and brother, the seven brothers killed by Aeneas. They all die for each other and seek to protect each other. This emphasizes the duty of a brother towards their other brother and the callousness of Aeneas. Brother and sister, uh, Turner's lives and Turner's advice and goes through to assist Lars in the battle. Husband and wife, um, they, Jupiter and Juno listen to each other after a while, but they're still at odds with each other, and Juno is not just an extension of Jupiter's will. Although this is probably just because she was a goddess, if they were mortal, it would be different. And father and daughter, Jupiter and Venus, she speaks to him kindly and is able to wheedle him into letting her do what she wants to help her son. Son. She ultimately has not listened to him and continues to help the Trojans as much as she can, but he doesn't punish her for not listening. Heroism. Now, um, Homeric. So we see Homeric Fura from Aeneas and Karma. We see arrogance from Pallas. We see um, father son relationships from Lausus. We see Mesentius. We see Karma and very physically skilled. Um, Turnus, we see arrogance. Karma is described as a lion like Achilles, and he's shamed at being taken away from the battle by Juno, which is a typical thing when Venus did the same thing with Paris and Aeneas in the Trojan War in the Iliad. We also see Roman heroism. So Aeneas is unwillingly doing all of this because he's fated to found Rome, such as piety towards the state. Um, he's not Roman in any sense with how he gets carried away and commits barbarous acts of violence, but hey, what can we say? Pallas is described as a bull in the simile, which perhaps links to the rural side of Rome, which is not suited to violent battle with a man such as Turnus. Um, Lausus is definitely not Roman, and neither is Mesentius, and Turnus is definitely not. Stoic. Aeneas is not stoic at all. He goes absolutely berserk. So, you know, Pallas is too prideful to really be stoic. Mesentius could be seen as stoic as he resigns himself to battle, um, probably death, and brings his horse with him, but maybe he's a bit too sentimental. And he dies in revenge for what has been done to his son. Uh, modern heroes, Aeneas is far too violent. Um, Pallas could be definitely a modern hero because he's sort of the young underdog who dies for his country and for whom pathos has been built up about. If you think about it, I could see him in an action movie being the main hero i can't see only yes thank you the villain uh Lausus saves his father despite him being evil and ruthless mesentius is not very heroic at all because of past history but he could be considered at least partially heroic because we have pathos built for him with the story of his horse and turnus is definitely not a modern hero as he kills a boy and gloats over it women so titana is seen as in an advisory role um to her brother and she's also seen as a goddess which chose to find favor Juno is um, she takes Turnus away from his the war, so some divine favour. And as a wife, she is different in mind to Jupiter, which would emphasise the fact that women are not just extensions of their husbands, although this could just be because she's a god, and so things are different for her. There are no societal constraints. There's also Venus, which shows divine favour. Her capacity as a mother, she seeks to look after her son and make sure he makes it out of this battle alive, and she disobeys her father. It's betrayal, but she gets away with it because she's a goddess. Then the gods. We've already done Juno and Venus. And Jupiter. He complains that all of the gods are getting involved in the fighting and serves as a source of balance. He emphasises Virgil's perceived, perceived view that no side is a particular fault for the war. Um, he says, I am the same god to all men. And he eventually allows Juno to do what she wants in taking she and turns away from battle, but emphasises that she cannot change the course of fate. Mars then sends men bad, mad with bloodlust, and Mars himself is in the hands of men. There's social, political and historical context. So you've got Augustan propaganda. There's violent battles, the sort of stuff that Octavian would have glorified in and necessary for a good epic, but against the notion of Augustan Pax. Um, the death of young men, Pallas, Lausus, etc. invokes ideas of Marcellus, Marcellus's mother and Octavian's sister. Um, Octavia was said to have fainted when she heard his name mentioned and Pallas's funeral procession is described very similarly to his in the next book.
The notion of fate, this has all been fated, including Augustus's accession to power and battle conventions. You should not take your enemy's weapon or armour, but should dedicate them to the gods and Turnus breaches this, and he will get his comeuppance soon. And you generally show mercy if your opponent is begging for it, but Aeneas doesn't. Finally, literary context of the Homeric epics, Aeneas's fury is like Achilles, Pallas' death is like Patroclus, human sacrifice just like the one in the Iliad does not go well, and Juno taking Turnus away is like Venus taking Aeneas and Paris away. And then we move on to book 11 for 10 minutes, yay. Okay, so book 11 is a pretty good book, we've got Camilla in it who's my favourite character, so pretty good, pretty fun. After the death of Mezentius, um, anxious and eager as Aeneas was to give time to burying his comrades, distraught as he was in, in, as he was in mind at their deaths, he still wants to pay his vow to the gods. He cuts off all the branches of an, of an oak, dedicates the mound as a trophy to the great god mighty in war, and then clothes it in Mezentius' armour. This is what a hero was meant to do when they defeated their enemy and took their armour, so it shows that Aeneas is following the proper procedure. All of the Trojan leaders are pressing hard around him, so he speaks a few words to them. He tells them that the greatest part of their work is done, and tells them about the armour that he has stolen from Mezentius, saying how they are spoils he has taken from a proud king the first fruits of war. He tells them to make themselves ready for war, and fill their minds with hope so that they will not hesitate. When that time comes, there must be no faint-heartedness or sluggishness in our thoughts to slow us down. He tells them that now they must bury their dead before they go out to fight, for that is the only honour a man has in the inner world. Aeneas decides that he should be taken back to Mavanda's city, and says that he was a warrior who did not fail in courage when his black day took him from us and drowned him in the bitterness of death. He is weeping and he makes his way back to where Pallas' body is guarded by Acoetes, Evander's old armour bearer. Around them all are their attendants and all the Trojans and Trojan women with their hair and bound in mourning after the manner of their people. But when Aeneas enters, they beat their breasts and raise a lament. When Aeneas sees Pallas' head in his face and the open wound, he begins to weep and says it is such a pity. Fortune came to me with smiles but took you from me while you were still a boy and would not let you live to see us in our kingdom or to ride back in triumph to your father's house. He says that this was not what he promised Evander and that Evander will be making offerings deluded by vain hopes at that very moment. He asks how Evander will receive his dead son, and says that Italy has lost a great bulwark, and great too is your lost Ulysses. This reveals that Aeneas almost seems to think of the palace as like a son to him, because he treats him like Ulysses' brother, and like their kingdom would belong to him also. He becomes a kind of father figure to Pallas, and he mourns him like a father would when he sees his body. After he has finished weeping, he orders the men to take up the pitiable corpse and sends a thousand chosen men as escorts to join their tears with Evander, a small comfort for a great sorrow. Other people weave a bier to make a raised couch, where they lay down Pallas, and he lies there like a flower cut by the thumbnail of a young girl, a soft violet or drooping lily, still with its sheen and its shape, though Mother Earth no longer feeds it and gives it strength. He brings out two robes woven with gold and purple, which Dido had made him, and places them on Pallas' body. He also orders spoils to be brought to the pyre too, adding the horses and weapons taken from their enemy and then the captives, whose hands he had bound behind their backs to send them as offerings to the shades of the dead and sprinkle the funeral pyre with the blood of their sacrifice. He commands the leaders of the army to carry tree trunks straight with the enemy's weapons and inscribe with their names. Acoetes is led along in the procession, beating his breast with clenched fists and tearing his face with his nails, but he collapses. Pallas's war horse Aethon follows behind, tears rolling down and great drops and soaking its face, while men carry his spear and helmet. The victorious Turnus had the rest. A large number of mourners followed, and after this procession has marched clear of the camp, Aeneas halts and says, The same grim destiny of war pulls us away from here to weep under tears. Forever hail, great Pallas, and farewell forever. Then, in silence, he marches back to the camp. Virgil wants to remind us of Patroclus' death from the Iliad in this, which was highlight Virgil's own doctor. Yeah? No. No. Can I talk to you later? Showing that he knows his Homeric links and that he is just as good as Homer with epic. Sorry about that. It also heightens the sympathy and shows Aeneas to be of the same vein as Achilles. He's just as good as him. Historically, it is also described very similarly to Marcellus' death procession, who had died around 20 BC and whose death had affected Augustus greatly. The Latin envoys are bearing olive branches wreathed in wool, and they ask for a truce. 
They beg Aeneas to give back the bodies of their men that lay strewn over the plain and to let them go to their graves in the earth, for he could have no quarrel with men who were defeated and lost the light of life. Aeneas agrees to a truce and adds the words that fortune is cruel. You ask me for peace for the dead, whose destiny has been to die in battle. I, for my part, would have been willing to grant them peace when they were still alive. He says he does not wage war with the people, but that it is Latinus who abandoned their friendship and preferred to put his trust in Turnus' weapons. He says that Turnus should have phased him alone, and that only one of them would live would have lived if he died. God or our own right hands would have seen to that. Drantius is described as an older man who had always hated the young warrior Turnus, and addresses Aeneas as O Trojan great in fame, and greater still in arms. He asks what he should praise first, his justice or his labours in war, and then says that he will gratefully carry his words back to Latinus. He will try to reconcile him with King Latinus, and Turnus can make his own treaties. We shall delight to raise the massive walls of fate to create for you and lift up the building stones of Troy on our shoulders. The two sides, Trojans and Latins, are together in the hills and woods and no man harmed another. They split oaks and cedar with wedges to make funeral pyres and they do not fight. This is for 12 days. Then rumour comes and warns Evander's house of anguish, and the Arcadians rush to the gates, snatching up funeral torches. The road is lit up and the Trojans come forwards, and when the mothers of Palantium first see them entering, the stricken city was ablaze with their cries. We are told that no power on earth could restrain Evander, and he threw himself into Pallas's body and clung to it, weeping and moaning, and saying that he has had a hard schooling in war. He says how none of the gods listened to his vows and prayers and invokes his wife saying that she was fortunate in her death as she did not live to see this day he says that he has outstayed his time a father should not survive his son and wishes that he had given up his own life rather than sent Pallas with Aeneas instead he doesn't blame the Trojans though and says that he will rejoice the death of his son was a debt he was fated to pay in his old age he says that he will rejoice to think that Pallas killed the enemy before his death and says that he would not wish a better funeral than this upon his son then he addresses Turnus, and you, Turnus, would now be standing in the fields, a huge headless trophy had Pallas been your equal in age, had the years given you both equal strength. He tells the Trojans to go back to Aeneas and continue fighting. Sorry, I keep writing the same thing over and over again, I'm trying not to repeat myself. When the dawn comes in, in a typical Heromeric simile, Tarkon and Aeneas build funeral pyres on shore and carry the bodies of their dead to them, each after the fashion of their fathers. They set fire to the pyres and the sky is plunged into darkness. Three times they ran round the blazing pyres in gleaming armour, three times they rode in solemn procession round the fires of the dead with wails and lamentation. Tears fell upon their armour and fell upon the earth beneath. Some throw into the flames spoils from the Latins, while others burn the possessions of their dead friends, and oxen are sacrificed to the god of death. They watch the bodies of their friends burn until night returns and shows the sky studded with burning stars. The Latins build similar piles, pyres quite a way away from the Trojans. They bury a few men in the earth, while others they carry back to their city or their countryside homes. The rest they burn and count as an honoured, a huge pile of got jumbled corpses, and after the third day they level the ash in which the bones of the dead were mingled and weigh it down with earth. On that day the noise of grief was at its loudest, and their long mourning reached its height. We are given a list of how the mothers, wives, sisters and children cursed the war in Turnus' marriage. Drancy's bitter swears that Turnus is the only man being asked to fight, but at the same time the Queen's name casts its protecting shadow and he is still in favour because of the memory of his great deeds. Turnus and Latinus are not viewed great by the people. Um, a lot of people that think that Turnus should go out and fight the battle alone, Drancy's included, while others, including the Queen and Marta, want to carry on with the war the way that it's going. Overall, though, they are all very much resentful of the war. Um, the envoys arrive back with a gloomy answer. Having achieved nothing for all their efforts, the Latins would have to look elsewhere for reinforcements or plead for people. Had indeed the Greek side. After they were admitted, they talked from their names and said who, who had made war among them. And Diomede replies that all of the people who attacked Troy are now scattered and have met awful fates. He mentions Menelaus and Agamemnon. He mentions how the, he bitterly regrets wounding Venus because that is what caused all of this and says that he begs them not to urge him to take part in the battle. He would rather they give the gifts they brought him to Aeneas. Believe me, if I have known it, how huge he rises behind his shield, what, with what a whir he spins his javelin. He says that if there were two Trojan heroes as great as Aeneas, it would be Greece that was in mourning, and that it was both Hector and Aeneas, both men noble in their courage, noble in their skill in arms, but Aeneas the greater in piety, that held back the Greek victory until the tenth year. Essentially, 
He tells them not to fight Aeneas and instead make a peace treaty with him. This is complete and utter rubbish that Virgil is making up from Homer. Just to let you know, read the Iliad, Aeneas is not a great warrior. This news is met with a confused war, described as when rocks resist a river in spate and the trapped waters eddy and growl while the banks on either side roar with the din of the waves. Latina says that they are fighting a misguided war against unconquerable heroes and the sons of gods, and that they have absolutely no chance of beating Aeneas and his men. He says that courage has done all that courage could do, but now he thinks that they should give an area of land to the Trojans as a token of their friendship. They should let them settle, and even if they want to leave, they should provide them with the materials to build their ships to do so. As well as this, he suggests that 100 envoys should be sent to make this treaty with Aeneas, holding out the branches of peace in their hands and bearing gifts. Drances then rises, hostile, who has always looked askance at Turnus's great reputation and was goaded by bitter jealousy. We are told that his voice had some weight in councils and was always a force for discord and jealousy. And then, then he speaks to Latinus, saying that everyone knows what their fortune is, but that everyone is too afraid to speak, say out loud. He says that it is because of Turnus's fatal recklessness that so many people have died and the whole of their city is now slumped in grief. He says that no one should be able to overrule Latinus's right to keep Lavinia to whichever man he sees feet feet fit and so turnus has no right to try to keep her for himself then he rouses on turnus and asks why turnus keeps dragging his fellow citizens into danger and calls him the single source and cause of all these sufferings of latium he says that all he wants is peace and that he begs him to pity his people and lay down his pride he says that however if turnus cannot give up his pride he can keep going with his fighting and that we the rank and file are to litter the fields unburied and unwept so that turnus can keep his arrogance and I think we will leave it at that cliffhanger and we'll find out what find out what Turner says. It's not gonna be nice. Okay, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, I didn't get as far as I wanted. I thought I could get to book 12. I think that was probably misguided. Um, yeah, I think I thought some notes were shorter than others and I didn't think I had that much left in book eight. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you found it useful. I hope you have a productive week and I will see you at some point to continue it. I think I'll probably finish it off tomorrow, get it over and done with. Okay, so thank you very much and bye.